Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just waiting for everyone to connect into the this tonight's webinar uh, from the Sikh Museum Initiative. Um, it's a real delight to have many of you back. I see some new faces and some old friends uh, in our live Zoom webinar. Um, and tonight we're going to be going through another topic that is very much at the heart of work that we do at the Seat Museum Initiative, and that's about introducing new technologies and using VR technology uh, to bring to life some of the amazing history and heritage that we have all around us. Um, one of the things that I always find fascinating uh, when learning more about history is how much history there is all around us, uh, whether that's in your local city or if you just drive out into the county or into the countryside, there's so many rich uh, pieces of you know, gems of hidden history. So um, my name is Gurdwar Singh. Um, I'm a part of the Sikh Museum Initiatives team and a big part of our vision uh, in our team is to bring to life uh, Anglo-Sikh history so that uh, people all around the world can have more accessibility, more connection and more engagement with history, uh, but also the use of technology. How can we integrate that to enhance the experience of you know, people all around the world? And I think the work that we've been doing with VR technology really complements um, you know, the, the physical lived experience of going to a museum. Um, so this evening, uh, we will be having uh, our speaker, Taryn Singh from Taryn 3D, uh, who will be going through the use of virtual reality technology and giving an introduction uh, to some of the technology that we've used in our project. Um, just to give you a bit of information about Taryn, Taryn is uh, the founder of an organization called Taryn 3D, and he is an expert in 3D technologies. I'm always impressed with uh, some of the amazing things he can do with a computer. He has been doing this, he's been a architectural engineer for 15 years um, and implemented 3D tech for the anglo Seek uh, Virtual Museum project. Uh, now our project is uh, funded by the National Horror Lottery Heritage Fund. Uh, and so we're always appreciative of the support that they've given to enable um, this whole project to go off the ground. So Taryn, uh, if I could hand over to you um, and just uh, for everyone else, uh, a few practical ground rules. If you do have questions, just write them to the Zoom chat and we will take them all at the end. Uh, we're expecting Taryn's presentation to last around about 30 minutes. Um, so that will give us ample time to to ask any burning questions or queries that you have. Um, so welcome everyone and Taryn, could I hand over to you? Thanks, Gurdwara. I'll just quickly share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the presentation, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so today's presentation uh, about uh, an introduction to VR, it's kind of like a quite a complicated topic, but I'm trying to like just give a general overview with the technology and quite a lot of engagement with schools and young people, adults uh, at museums, uh, various different places. So we've got some really good experience in uh, creating VR uh, uh, experiences and also taking them out. And, and we learned a lot of things along the way. So we're going to share some of those ideas today. Um, so yes, yeah, so VR, everyone's kind of very excited about it at the moment. I know it's a, it's a kind of like a buzzword and everyone's talking about it. It's very exciting. And a lot of kind of childhood dreams are, are kind of being fulfilled because it's something that we dreamed of when we watched Star Trek when we were younger. And um, uh, so a little bit about myself. I'm director of uh, Talent 3D. It's a 3D design consultancy. I may, mainly work with uh, engineering firms, but I also work with heritage um, and community projects as well. Uh, so I have a background in 3D and CAD specialist. Uh, so I have a master's degree in computer aided design. And I've also worked at uh, Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery as well. So worked in various different kind of uh, fields. Uh, so I've got a good amount of experience in, in, in all those types of things. So I'm very interested in the creative aspect of 3D and VR in terms of um, visual aesthetic of 3D models and materials and textures and getting things looking accurate and, and beautiful. So one of the main um, uses of uh, VR, so I'm just gonna cover a couple of uses of VR. So one of the main uses is gaming, obviously. And you're going to see this in because we're going to cover the current generation of VR and how, how it's come to be. So gaming is a massive use. You're also seeing it being used for training as well. So massive use at the moment in training people. This is the astronauts at NASA 
using uh, VR technology to kind of um, prepare for upcoming missions. Uh, massive uh, military are heavily looking into VR to be able to train their soldiers, put them in situational training and uh, to measure responses and, and, and to guide them um, in, in, in real life situations. Uh, we've also got uh, a VR being used for kind of a spatial kind of mapping. Uh, Google Earth uh, has released a Google Earth VR, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, if you're looking around environments and want to fly around and get a good idea of uh, environmental, you know, spatial spaces, sorry. Uh, massive use for kind of uh, medical uses at the moment. So training uh, medical students and uh, training um, school children as well. Massive use in VR there. You're also seeing, um, especially since the coronavirus um, uh, situation on lockdown, um, a lot of conferences were canceled. So a lot of these conferences started doing online VR conferences. Um, so you can see people, all these people avatars in here are actually like people who are with a VR headset who are looking around. Although I'm kind of a bit skeptical about this sort of use because I just think that Zoom works so well. Why would you want to put a headset in and kind of go into this kind of environment? But we're going to see how this develops um, as we get along. It's very, very early. So um, you're also seeing different sorts of simulators uh, being kind of implemented. So this was uh, one done by Toyota, and they were looking at how when you're driving and somebody's trying to communicate with you or you've got different distractions, how it distracts you from driving. So it's kind of a, a good way of testing um, different situations and how people respond in those situations. Uh, you're also seeing schools as well. So you're seeing this is uh, from the uh, London Grid for Learning. They're, they're kind of investing in this um, class VR where they have a control system that can be um, um, used in a classroom situation. Um, you're also seeing um, a lot of uh, kind of usage or testing into using it for, for the elderly, for mental health, for PTSD. And although there's a lot of you know, studies that are being done at the moment, there's nothing kind of really conclusive at the moment. I know a lot of salespeople like to really push you know, how successful it is, but I, I would say you, know, you need, really need to kind of uh, um, look at it a, a, a bit more, kind of take a step back and, and, and look at it a bit more carefully in terms of how effective it can actually be. There's no kind of conclusive studies at the moment, uh, but obviously um, you can see how, how it could be useful for, for some, some situations. Um, we're also seeing it used for tourism at the moment, and it, it, that's especially kind of uh, prominent at the moment during the lockdown, where VR experiences um, are being used to entice people into different environments, uh, in, into coming down and you know um, being more interested in in in, in the location. Um, so I've got a couple of uh, museum uses of VR, which I thought were interesting. Um, so I think the Louvre did a, a, a VR um, interactive of the Mona Lisa, where you could actually step into the painting and they animated uh, Mona Lisa as well. So you see her kind of uh, responding. Um, uh, London Science Museum did a space descent VR, so you could see kind of one of the capsules um, uh, uh, re-entry into Earth. And so you could put a headset on and that was like a Kind of like an experience that people are going to the museum to have. Um, the Smithsonian, we're also looking at VR, as in, you know, how would a VR museum, what it would it look like, and what might it be, you know, in the future, how are people going to explore museums? And uh, the National Museum of Finland used uh, virtual reality to try and travel into this painting, actually, which I thought was really interesting. I thought that was a quite quite an interesting um, uh, approach to. Um, to kind of VR, to kind of uh, um, maybe interest people in the painting more, the artwork more. Um, this one was a good one as well for, from the Tate Modern in 2018. They recreated um, uh, an artist's, um, um, his studio uh, from 100 years ago uh, in Paris, and people were able to kind of uh, uh, step into this environment here, yeah, put on a headset, and then walk around this environment and have a look. So that's kind of really interesting as well, seeing the type of paintings that he did, what type of paints he was using, things like that. And then we've also got our project as well, and we feel that our project is quite a you know pioneering project in terms of uh, what it can do. So currently, um, if I go over to our web page, um, you can click on uh, the relics here, and you can click on any one of these objects and experience them in 3D. So this actually works on mobile. So while it's not VR, um, it still gives you kind of like a, a, um, a good sort of 3D experience of those objects. 
So I'll just wait for that to load up. So here you go. So you've got a 3D object here that you can kind of uh, turn around and play around with and zoom into and see detail. So we are going to be sharing uh, in a bit. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the VR version of, of our museum. So I'm going to be showing you an example of that near the end of the uh, uh, presentation. So we're going to look at how do these objects work in VR. Okay. So what, why are people using VR at the moment? So there's various different advantages that VR gives you. It gives you the ability to look into the future or the past. Um, it's very good for spatial development, exploration of physical spaces, and obviously for education as well. If you imagine you can take children to different places, show them different objects, uh, allow them to explore in different ways. Um, it's also quite good for designing as well because it means that people in remote locations can log in together and can kind of design together, work on work on stuff together. And obviously you've got like entertainment and games and e-commerce where you know it will naturally kind of make its way into those fields. Um, in terms of like uh, the, the kind of current climate, I mean, um, if you look at the growth forecasts, I mean, um, uh, some of the forecasts uh, are saying that, you know, it, it would add about 1.5 trillion to the global economy by 2030. This is the kind of impact it's gonna have on business and the way things are done in future. And also, we've already seen some examples there, but you can see here, um, this, this is a study done in 2018, looking at which different, um, basically, uh, which different um, fields the immersive technology was being used in. And you can see here that it's kind of pervading quite a lot of different areas. So it is touching a lot of different, um, uh, different kind of fields of study. Uh, so if we go back to the beginning, um, I mean, there's loads of different examples of VR in the past, but this one I thought was really interesting. This is called the Sensorama, and it was a guy called Morton Helig in America in the 1950s, and he created this machine where you could kind of uh, put your head into this kind of contraption, and it showed you kind of like two videos for, for each um, eye. And the funny thing was that he actually included wind and, and, and sound and, um, you know, smells as well. He kind of included in there. But it didn't actually go anywhere. He was well ahead of his time, and you know it didn't really kick off at that time. But if you look at his camera here as well, you can see that he's actually got two um, two cameras. So he kind of like realized that um, to get like three D video, you need the, the perspective of two eyes. So that's a really interesting development. Along the years, you had loads of different developments, loads of different ideas. It was a dream of everyone to be able to kind of step into like a, a game that people were playing and you know it was a realm of science fiction and I'll very cheaply put in uh, Lawn Mowman if anyone can remember that film from the 1990s uh, which looked at VR and how it was going to kind of enhance our brains and make us uh, megalomaniacs which I thought was pretty interesting and um, so one of the primary driving factors of VR the current generation at the moment has been graphics power so this is a graphics card that goes into a computer and this has been the primary kind of driving force of VR and what's made it possible and graphics power has mainly been driven by computer games. So um, this is a game. So if, if you think about it, this is a game from 2003. And on the right hand side, you've got a game from uh, 2018. And you can see the difference in the graphics, whereas the one on the left, very blocky, very simple. And the one on the right, you've actually got individual people. You've got cars moving. You've got, you know, it, you've got um, a daylight system and so much more. So the graphics uh, cards have become so much more powerful. They could actually um, handle much more kind of uh, advanced um, 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 graphics. So um, the current generation started around 2012. So this is the Electronic Entertainment Expo. And this is basically uh, the, the biggest games expo in the world where all the games companies come to show off their stuff. And at the 2012 Games Expo, uh, this kind of uh, sellotape headset over here was, uh, was demonstrated as a viable solution for doing VR. In the past, it hadn't been a good solution. There was too much kind of delay and the graphics wasn't powerful enough. And there's this guy here who kind of introduced it and that's John Carmack. And uh, he's like a legend from the 90s who made all those old famous 3D games like Doom and um, you know Wolfenstein and stuff like that. So he's quite famous. And he was part of a group um, that were kind of discussing uh, VR headsets. And there was a guy here uh, called uh, Palmer Lucky and he's a lecturer at the university, a researcher, and he came up with an idea that actually, you know what, I think the graphics power is, uh, the graphics quality is enough now that we could actually run one of these headsets. 
So he started a Kickstarter campaign to raise $250,000 to create this VR headset. Um, it reached the goal within a couple of hours and within 24 hours, it had a million dollars. And within the end of its campaign, it had um, this uh, $2.5 million to uh, develop this. So they started developing this year uh, um, uh, as soon as they got that funding. Um, this is actually the first headset that they created. So this is, it was called the CV1 and it was released in 2013, a year later. And uh, the term HMD or head mounted display or headset became kind of quite popular then as well. So um, I've also wanted to share with you. So two years later, um, what happened was Oculus actually, uh, sorry, Oculus, the company that created this um, prototype headset. And at the time it was a prototype were bought by Facebook for $2 billion. So it kind of gives you an idea of the kind of interest in this sort of technology. Whereas two years ago, they were funded for two and a half million and two years later, they were bought for 2 billion. Um, so how does it work? So um, the idea was quite simple actually. So um, what the main part of it that we're mainly interested in is this HD display here. So this HD display here would actually give you um, this. So it would take two cameras and it would feed a video for it would split the, the, the screen in two and give you one feed for the for the left eye over here and one feed for the right eye and then this would be enclosed in a, in a case so it's enclosed in the case here and then what you have is these two lenses here so i'm going to just circle these lenses here that you can see and what these do is they just basically distort these uh, the, these two videos on the right hand side and kind of present them to the eye so that you can you you look as if you're looking from your eye viewpoint so it's quite, quite a simple idea uh, and the graphics could handle it now because the frame rate needs to be a lot faster than a, a normal kind of um, game that you're playing. So um, in between um, that happening, um, so just before um, Facebook bought them, Google were also doing some research as well. And they came out with this very, very simple solution. It was basically just a cardboard cutout, which when folded up with some lenses stuck onto here, um, onto the front of it, you could actually kind of um, use this sort of Google Cardboard to um, view uh, VR. But the difference that it had was that it actually used your mobile phone. So, I mean, if I, uh, if, if you look at this uh, video again, when it starts again, so you saw that they just put the, the phone into the Google Cardboard. Can you see the two, the two eye, eye views and then you've got the lenses on the other side. And what this used was the acceler accelerometer or the gyroscope in the mobile. So your mobile has a gyroscope in it and it kind of works at the orientation of the phone. So it was working out where you were looking um, in terms of, uh, you, you know, the position of the mobile phone. But the problem was you couldn't actually walk along. So if you took a step, it wouldn't actually know that you took a step. Or if you moved your head from side to side, it would not know. It only knew the orientation of, of the actual um, um, mobile. So after the Google Cardboard, um, in 2016, this is where we had the major jump in uh, VR headsets, 2016. There were three headsets. So this is only like uh, three, three years after um, Oculus had released their kind of prototype. Um, and there was a company called HTC um, who make mobile phones. And they, alongside a company called Valve, which is a really, really famous game company, developed this HTC Vive um, headset. PlayStation were also interested in VR, so they made their VR headset as well, which plugs into their PlayStation consoles. But we're not so interested in this one because it's just a it's just a games machine, so it just plugs into the um, games console. But some interesting information about that later. So Oculus eventually released the 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 the, the headset, which was called the Rift. Yeah, so that was called the Rift, and that was released in 2016. And Vive was their main competitor, and and they use. And we're going to go through what makes them slightly different. Okay, so one of the primary things that a VR headset needs to do is it needs to track your head and needs to know where you're moving. And the way they do that is through head tracking. So it's matching a virtual camera to your head location. And there's two ways that they do this. There's external tracking and inside out tracking. And don't worry, I'm going to explain it to you, yeah? So what the first um, VR headset did that Oculus made was it actually had a VR camera. And what this VR camera did, so this is a sensor here, it actually just threw out an infrared, um, it, it was an infrared camera and it could detect infrared lights. So this is the infrared camera on the left hand side and this is the headset and you can see these little green points that it's picking up. 
yeah and i'll show you this is actually what the the the, the, the actual it kind of picks up these points and then it knows where the where the headset is in space yeah so when they actually released the, the original one what they realized was there was actually an issue here so the problem here is that there's only a certain amount of uh, there's only a certain amount of um, space that it can it can it can detect so if you move your head outside the space it would stop detecting your movement so you only had a short amount of space especially if you're very close to your computer. So this is one of the issues they were having. So when they released the, the second one, they had uh, they said, okay, let's put two cameras in and then we can detect more space. So in the next one, this is actually one of the setups. So there's the monitor there. These are the two cameras and you can see the camera for us from here showing what it's looking at. So it's looking through there, looking for the headset and then it's detecting. And then you have this kind of space in the middle. This is the area where it's going to mainly concentrate on. So it gives you like a like a five by eight foot sort of area to kind of play in, which is quite restrictive. So the HTC Vive, which was uh, uh, which is the competitor to Oculus, and um, they chose a different approach. What they did was they used these lighthouses, which are which are these boxes here. So you would mount these on the wall or onto tripods. Um, and what these essentially did was, so you can see here, you've got these. So just imagine those are on tripods or they're stuck to the wall. What these do is they rotate um, 60 times uh, 60 times per second, and they basically throw a laser across the room, and then they detect the headsets that way. And the advantage was that it's a much better system. And the other advantage is that you get much larger space. So as you can see, and they called it room scale tracking, where you know, we, we've got this uh, kind of space. Now, these VR headsets, uh, it's interesting to kind of uh, note is that they do not work on their own yet. They must be connected to a computer. And the computer obviously has to be connected to a screen. And this is one of the issues we're going to come up with uh, it, that we found with, with these early headsets. This is just an idea showing you what the difference is between the different headsets. So um, we're looking at this, this green area is, is the Vive headset. Obviously, the room scale tracking has the largest area. The Rift area is, 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 is a little less. And then you can see the PlayStation one, which is this one here, is obviously a lot less. So, so the, the HTC Vive actually kind of beat out Oculus in terms of the quality of the tracking and the space that you could do it in as well. Um, the other thing that they implemented was interaction control. So how are you going to interact with the environment? So they all have their own different types of controllers. So these controllers here, they kind of um, they kind of allow you to interact with, uh, with, with, the, with the environment and also kind of um, touch and hold and pick up objects. And they all look very different, but they essentially do the same things and they give you kind of uh, various controls for gripping, for pointing and holding. Okay, so coming to one of the issues that we had with these headsets starting off here, this is just an idea of, uh, this is the, this one on the left-hand side is a PlayStation setup. And as you can see, you've got the, the headset over here, but then look what you've got here. You've got this cable that comes down here into this box here, and then you've got this cable down here, and then another cable that goes and plugs into here, and another cable comes here, and then another cable down there, and then another one that goes to the TV. And on the right-hand side, I'm just showing you what comes in the box when you buy a Vive. And this is actually what came in the box. So we actually moved to the HTC Vive uh, uh, quite a bit uh, later because we thought the tracking was better and it allowed us to do uh, much more kind of um, um, uh, like a better kind of a, a VR experience. So this is actually what came in the box. And, and this is the difficulty that we had with it. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of some of the setups here. So you can see somebody here who's using a VR headset over here. And out the back is coming a cable, and this cable is actually coming up here and attached to this PC over here. This, this PC is in turn attached there. So all these uh, headsets actually work off, off a computer that is required, and it needs to be quite a powerful computer. The issue with this setup here as well, that if he moves slightly a bit more to back, if he moves back a little bit and he pulls this cable, his computer is going to come smashing down and it's going to crash. Um, so that's kind of like a safety issue there. This is from one of the shows where Vive was showing off their, their, their kind of headset. And as you can see, again, we've got the headset over here, but we've got a cable coming down. And there's a couple of issues here. As you can see, yeah, he's actually stepping on the cable here. So that's one issue. So people can actually step on the cable. 
which is being stepped on here. Um, the other issue here as well is the fact that um, he is very close to this sofa here. And obviously he can't see um, because he's actually seeing what's on the screen here. He's, he's seeing a completely different environment. And if he moves to his right now, he will actually bang into that, that um, sofa or if it's a chair or if it's a table. So there are there were some issues around, uh, around, and if he swings or he tries to do something and there's somebody in the way or somebody standing there, and obviously there's no barrier at the back here, so somebody could just walk in, and if he swings, you know, he swing, he's swinging, he's playing a tennis game, and he swings and he smacks someone in the face, that's obviously like a safety issue there, and, you know, it has happened, and, you know, um, so, so there's, there, there was an issue with it when you're doing this, you have to be very careful in terms of planning out your space, planning out where the cables are going to go, and your facilitators have to be always on guard, as in who is walking into the space, how we're holding the cable, and how I'm doing this. So an example of this is in 2018, we went, or I think it was 2017 or 2018, we went to the Ind an Indian summer where they do an outdoor, um, they do an outdoor video, of, uh, uh, sorry, an outdoor cinema event um, in Leicester. And we actually took out our VR equipment and we set up um, our VR equipment in, in, in the actual square outside. And we were able to take the museum in a way, our VR museum, we were able to take it out to people, show them. And the idea was to engage people um, in their environments rather than bringing them into a museum environment where they might not normally be comfortable, is to go out and try to entice them to be interested in these objects and, and start that conversation with them. But at the same time, one thing that we realized was, and you'll see from these photographs here, there's a lot of tables. You can see the, the, the Vive headset over here, which is kind of tracking. There's probably another one on this side over here, which is tracking from over here. And uh, one thing you'll see on even on the bottom right hand is the amount of cables. And you see I'm holding this cable here because I'm, I'm just trying to be careful. And then power leads are going around the back to one, head, one uh, sensor and then power leads to the other sensor. And if somebody steps in the way of those sensors with either headset, then you lose the, the tracking and then people would say, oh, something's gone wrong. So those kind of issues were kind of quite quite prominent in those early tests that we did. This is actually a video of um, that event, people using the VR headset and, and looking through. So we're going to look at this and how it's how it's moved on. Okay. So then we came to the hardware. One thing we found was that actually these VR headsets actually require quite powerful machines to run. And the main kind of um, um, bottleneck is usually uh, the graphic card. So here we've got the minimum requirements, and then we've got the recommended requirements. And obviously, the minimum requirements. I mean, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even bother with that because you'll get a very like um, like a diminished experience. So when we went for these recommended um, um, computers, we realized that we had to buy um, a better graphics card for our computer, upgrade it. Get something that's a bit more powerful that could run it and this can be costly as well so on the right hand side i just did a quick search and gave you uh, what their recommended graphics card is and you can see it ranges from 137 to 200 pounds just for the graphics card that you might need to upgrade to be able to run vr experiences so when we were looking at computers as well so we're looking at 2020 we're looking at a computer for vr and um, you know it ranges from the low end from about 600 pound which might struggle a bit, and then the mid-range around here, and then they're going, uh, you know, into the more powerful range, you know, for the for the Uber gamers who want more and more experience. So this is another issue that we found that we had to really research the type of equipment we're using because VR doesn't work on all PCs. It has to be a specific piece, type of PC that has a, um, a powerful graphics cards and enough processing power to process the video, uh, send the video to the headset. Okay, so we started looking at laptops as well because we were going mobile, we were going to schools and uh, universities and museums, and we started to look at laptops. And again, see they range from, you know, low end, seven to 800 pounds to a thousand pounds to, you know, you know, some crazy 3000 uh, pounds. What we settled on in the end were these Dell G7 models, which were kind of workstation machines uh, used for kind of, um, um, these were used for, um, for kind of doing CAD work and 3D work. And I'm used to using these sorts of machines in my practice. And they were kind of like a decent price, good support. And also what we found was that they were ready for VR. So you can actually look on your 
um, when you're looking for a PC, you can actually look for this ready for VR to make sure that the hardware that you're buying can actually handle the, uh, the, the, the VR that you're looking for. So, and um, then in 2019, this, this uh, Oculus brought out this, this small headset, it's called the Oculus Quest. Now, if you can see what's different about this, it actually has these cameras, four cameras on each side. And what was different about this was that it's actually just came, it just came in a little bag like this. So you've got a VR headset and two controllers and nothing else. And what they did was they put a mobile computer in there to, to ensure that uh, it didn't have to be plugged into a computer. Now, this was very interesting because what it did was it did away with all the wires. And it used a different way to track your environment as well. So whereas the, the early headsets were using an external system to track uh, the headset, this used an internal system. So it uses contrast points in the environment to track where it is in the location. So um, you'll see an example here uh, just after this. So as you can see, she's looking around and what you're gonna see is it's gonna start to track the different contrast points here. So it's tracking those contrast points and then it's giving uh, the software an idea of, okay, this is the layout of the room and this is how I need, this is, this is where it's moving in relation to these points. So it's a really good way of tracking and it works really well. Um, if a lot of people are moving around you, like people are walking around, which we found in some of the museums when people are walking around, the tracking would go out because those points it's trying to track were getting distracted by people walking. So we had to kind of enclose, um, make sure that, that the person was enclosed in their own little area. Um, they also came up with another novel idea as well. So in terms of safety, what they did was they, they came up with an idea of having this guardian system. So what you do is you told the system where the floor was so it knows where you're standing. So it gets your head height. And then what it allows you to do is it allows you to draw on the floor the area that you think you can move around in. So as you see here, he's drawing on the floor now and he's creating that kind of a, a space on the floor. So this is the area that I can move around in safely. And we do this when we go into the museum. So we look at the space, we, we draw this out, this guardian, and then we explain to people, if you see a cage that comes up, um, that means you've gone too far, but we're always monitoring them anyway. So you'll see here, if he gets too close to the edge of this environment, see so it goes red and then it comes on and it tells him that actually you're very close uh, to this boundary now. So that's kind of like a little safety, safety mechanism there, but it will not detect if somebody walks into that space. So you still have to be mindful of that. Um, the other thing that they did was, which was a really clever move, was they allowed you to plug it into a PC and use it like the previous head generation of headsets as well. So while it wasn't as powerful as the other headsets that we looked at, um, because it's obviously working off an internal computer in the headset, um, you could still plug it into a headset, uh, into a PC and use it like a normal machine. What this meant was that you could leverage the power of the PC to run this mobile device. Um, headset, which is which is really kind of uh, interesting because you get the best of both worlds. And I mean, it comes in a little bag like this and you can take it anywhere. When I first saw this, I thought this is going to be a game changer because it's so accessible. When we were taking out, you know, VR headsets with um, all these um, cables and stuff, we took that out with a PC and a laptop and all these cables. I mean, people were like, oh my God, this is a bit too complicated. But when we went out with uh, just that, and we said, yeah, just pop it on, you know, have, uh, have a go. Um, it's much more accessible. It's much more easy because there's no cable to look out for and we can set it up to already be in the environment when they come into it. So we do all this uh, Guardian setup before we let people use it. Um, so uh, moving forward to 2020, beginning of this year, we started taking these Quest headsets. So we moved to the Quest headsets and we had a really good, we found that we got brilliant engagement with this. We were able to get families using it they were much more comfortable using it. And we actually changed the way that we as well. So we're gonna cover, I'm gonna cover in terms of um, having this experience. So that it's like kind of like a bit more of a shared experience. And we can also show, um, we can also show what the child is seeing. So pe other people can see um, what they're seeing. And we can also put in, we all, as you can see here at the, at the front, we've also got some barriers up as well. Uh, so other people can't walk into that space. Okay. So one thing that VR does sometimes is it can give you the feeling of being sick. 
Um, and the reason that this happens is um, like you're looking uh, inside the headset, so you're seeing it's completely replacing your env uh, environment. So the difference between uh, virtual reality and augmented reality is virtual reality replaces your environment, whereas augmented reality puts 3D objects into your existing environment. So with virtual reality, it covers everything. And if, if, if in the VR headset, you're sitting down or you're standing and the VR headset is, is it, you're moving along, what, what tends to happen is that um, you, you're starting to think, actually, wait a second, your brain starts to get confused, saying, actually, I'm moving forward, but, I'm, but I can't feel myself moving forward. So what tends to happen is you start to feel really sick. You get this motion sickness. And we realized this when we were trying to get people to kind of, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> when we were asking people to walk around the environment in our early tests, what we found was, that people were starting to feel sick because they were walking around, but they were standing still. And that really confuses your kind of balance and everything. So what we did was we took out the movement completely. We took out the controllers completely and made it really simple. So you stand in one place, you can turn around and you can look around. Another thing that we did was we placed the objects around the subject so they didn't have to walk too far or travel anywhere. They could just stand there and look around. So rather than having a moving experience, it was more of a 360 experience that you look around. Uh, the other thing that we found was that if you play well, if, if people are uncomfortable standing up because it removes them from their current environment, give them a seat to sit down, they can sit down, they feel a bit safer. If you make the experience slower, so there's no sudden movements or uh, uh, juddering, that makes them feel a bit more comfortable as well. So, um, um, also, um, another thing that we found was that rather than having people walk to a place uh, get them to teleport to a place because then you just appear in, a, in another place and it's about getting your brain to kind of um, make sense of what's going on in your environment uh, because physically you're not moving uh, but if you teleport to another place you can say oh yeah I've disappeared here and funnily enough um, I played uh, I, I used to get quite sick sometimes using some VR experiences but if I was sitting in a, an airplane or a car and it was moving along I, I didn't feel sick because my brain thought, actually, I'm in a car, I'm sitting still, but I'm moving, the car's moving. And funnily enough, that actually didn't make me sick. So I was kind of like, okay, so I need to make sense in my brain and we need to make people comfortable with it. And, and some people, it's just gonna take a bit of time for them to get used to it because there's a quite a, uh, it, it can feel quite um, disjointed. Some people don't like the experience because they can't see their hands, they can't see their body. And um, some, for them, it takes a bit of time for them to get used to it. So some of the recommendations for museums. So one thing I really want to cover is um, there's a big issue with hygiene at the moment with headsets, because obviously with social distancing, you can't be having uh, shared headsets like loads of people coming in like we did at the museum. Uh, currently, there's no way of um, sanitizing the headsets enough uh, for the current kind of level of safety that we need. So it may even be a situation where we can't use VR headsets in a public situation until there's a vaccine or until there's a way of cleaning these or um, covering them enough so that they can be easily cleaned and replaced for somebody else. So that is a massive issue for VR at the moment um, in a shared spaces or in museums. So that is something that I would say to everyone that um, until the coronavirus issue is, is, is dealt with, you know, there's gonna be issues with that. So um, the, 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 it's not something that you can have as, a, as a, like an exhibit in a museum like we do with the touch screen. The touch screen was very successful, but you can't leave a headset there because um, you know it, it needs to be explained. People need to be kind of introduced to it because it's very new technology. And um, whenever there's other people around as well, it, the, the care and safety needs to be taken care of. So it must be supervised. Um, it's good if you prepare an info sheet before they go into the experience, so it, it kind of prepares them a little bit for for, for what they're going to experience. Uh, we found to keep it very simple, our early experiment with the VR experience had loads of different controls, so you could play audio, you could pick up the objects, you could do this and that, and people just didn't get it. And so we just took, just really took it back and made it very, very simple, and we found a lot more success. People had much more of an enjoyable experience. We keep the movement to a minimum. And another thing we found is, especially when in your museum situation or a school situation where you've got a queue of people, you want to keep the experience to three to five minutes. And we think that's quite comfortable. That is anything more than that. Some people start to feel a bit uncomfortable with it, but that's enough. You should have an experience that people can explore a little bit, have a nice experience for three to five minutes, get off it and feel that they've got some value from it as well. 
and it needs to kind of add to the experience of the museum. It's not to take away from the museum experience. It's and and what we found at the Newark Houses Museum, where we had um, so going back to kind of this situation, what we found was it was something that they could come in and have a have a bit of an experience, something different, something that engaged them with with the historic objects gave them something to talk about and walk away and, and feel as though they had some fun as well doing it. So the whole point of um, making it simple and making it a bit fun and not too complicated um, actually worked really well, uh, we found. Um, we also found creating enclosure, so try and kind of enclose the space that you can use to minimize other people walking in. And, and, and also we found the experience shouldn't require more than a 10 second explanation. If you have to explain controls and buttons and things like that, then you know what, you're gonna lose people because nobody's gonna retain that information unless they've used it a few times. And I think sometimes as uh, developers, we kind of forget kind of um, that most people are not kind of um, um, used to those sorts of uh, views, um, experiences. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm coming to the end of the presentation. And what I quickly want to do is just show you our VR experience, um, how we're doing it. So here you can see this is actually the, the VR environment. I was going to. Cover like how to develop for VR. Uh, essentially, you, you pick a games engine, uh, they give you like a, um, a interface for the devices, and then you can start to program these environments. So, this is the environment that we've created. As you can see, you stand in the middle and you can look at these objects. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my VR headsets on. So, I've got my VR headset. This is the Quest uh, plugged into the computer. I'm going to press play here, and then you're going to see what, what I see here. So yeah, you can see what I'm seeing now at the moment. And you can see my hand, I'm moving my hand with this controller. And I can actually look around and look at these objects. So you can see there's, it doesn't require me to move around anywhere. I can look up at the flag and uh, here. If I do want to get up and walk around, I can actually do that. If I want to walk in and kind of explore these objects a bit more. But um, we tend not to give the controller in a school environment because, um, you know, the kids like to swing it around. But eventually, we have made a very simple kind of control on here. So you can click on the object and, and click on it, and it will move it into your hand. So you can actually hold it and have a look at it. And we find it's a very interesting way of you to be able to look at these objects and you know explore them. Uh, one thing you may find is if you find that it's not very smooth, yeah, it's very smooth for me. But obviously, we're streaming over the internet. So you're probably going to get some lag on what you're seeing. But uh, it's actually moving very smooth in my hand. Uh, so I can look at this jewelry here as well and have a look at the back of it. So yeah, and even the shield is all I can hold. And it's very easy. I'm just clicking one button, and even this flag here as well. So if I grab this uh, this flag, um, you'll see that I can actually hold this flag while it's blowing in the wind. And we thought that was really the kids absolutely love that when they're able to hold it and actually move it around and they they have a little play around with it. And so, yeah, so you can pick up any of these items and have a look at them. And, you know, um, you can even pick this up and try and wear it as well. So that's like a brief view of our VR experience and how it works. And as you can see, it's very, very easy to use, very simple. And we have thought about incorporating kind of audio and extra controls into there. But um, for the moment, we're going to be uh, keeping it as simple as possible. So that's um, the presentation. I've probably um, kind of glossed over loads of information and maybe kind of um, not uh, included everything, but I'll try to keep it quite broad, give you a, a good idea of um, you know, how it works and how, how to use it. And, um, and also a demo of um, our VR museum experience as well. So I'll just finish there and hand over to Kartar so you can, if there's any questions, uh, that we can cover those. Well, we, well, thank you ever so much, Taryn, for that presentation. That was um, illuminating. Uh, I think I feel like I learned more and more about the work that you do and the technology and how it imp impacts on uh, the world that we live in. Um, so we do have two questions in the chat. If anyone else does have questions that they would like to ask, just type away into the chat and we can ask them to 
Karen and get his response. So uh, we had a question on our Facebook live uh, from M Singh, and he was saying, can biological systems like cells be visualized and how would someone like a beginner go about it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, that can definitely be done. And I've, uh, I have actually worked with a company that wanted a, a VR, uh, we did a 3D model of the heart that could actually come apart and you could go through the valves and you can actually journey through each of the different valves and see how the blood moved through. It was an educational VR experience. So definitely something like that, yeah. I mean, I mean, pretty, pretty much you can create whatever you want. I mean, your imagination is the, um, you know, th there's no limit really. Um, and then something like that. And, and there are a lot of companies who are creating educational material for, for, for various different kind of uses. So 100%. For a beginner to get started, I would say start to use, and, and I always say this to everyone, start to use VR, go to places where you can experience it and have a look at different applications as well and see the way that they're doing things. So I'm always looking at other people and how they're kind of dealing with these issues. How are they dealing with interaction? How are they dealing with menus? Because because it's such an early technology, there's no standards for this. There's no standards for user interface. There's no standards for, you know, what is the best way for people to move around. Everyone's just like experimenting and trying out their own thing. And we're just learning as we're going along. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's a lot of experimentation and exposure to it. And also working out what doesn't work as well, because I know there's a lot of VR evangelists out there who kind of really push the technology and say, think it's the answer for everything. I'm a bit more kind of realistic about it and say that, look, it's not the answer to everything. We need to learn more about it. We need to test it and experiment with it. And in some cases, I always I always had this thing, the last place I used to work, um, I used to say, but, but why do you need to use a headset? You know, why do you want to use a VR headset? You know, can it be done easily? For example, the, the, the seminars that I've been done in VR, where you've got, you know, the VR social kind of thing where everyone's in a headset. I mean, Zoom works really well. Why wouldn't you just use Zoom? You know, why use a VR headset then? So I think uh, the question you need to ask is, what will the VR headset add to that experience? So especially for museums, what is going to add to experience? It's not a gimmick that you just add in there. You know, what is it going to add for, for the people coming in? What value is it going to provide them? And if for us, we found that the value was um, that kind of that fun factor and that little bit of experience um, rather than trying to teach them a whole history of something or, you know, making it too complicated or too um, heavy on information. Yeah. Um, and another question that we've had from Melissa Hawker on our Facebook live feed um, and she's asking, there are issues for people with disabilities. Um, it looks like it adapts to different heights, so I guess it would be adaptable for a wheelchair user. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, yeah, we've had wheelchair users use them. We've had people with other disabilities use them as well. And because our experience doesn't require anyone to move around or use the controller, you can use it without the controller. Um, everyone can get a similar experience, so they'll get an equal experience. And, uh, um, yeah, no, definitely. And uh, it will adjust to the height as well. Brilliant. I, I had a question here from Graham Randall. Um, uh, you mentioned PC and headset costs. Can you comment on the cost of producing the 3D content, which is quite significant? Okay, yeah, the, 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 the content production has been quite expensive, but that's because it's a new technology and anyone that can do it is, are finding themselves in, in high demand. And obviously when people don't know so much about it, they're speaking to people who are kind of like, um, you know, VR is a bit of a cha-ching cha -ching for a lot of uh, technology businesses because they think, you know, um, it, it's a good way. But but I, I think that it's, it's very similar to people who are already doing 3D interactive technologies and they can transition into doing um, VR quite easily. It's, you know, it's getting easier and easier to produce and therefore the price should become a lot more cheaper as well. I mean, I can't put a, a cost on it, but... Um, um, it's, it's, it's one of them things, it depends on how complex the environment, how complex the objects are, um, because that's where the time is taken in creating the environment, creating the objects that you're going to interact with, that's where the time is taken. The VR headset pretty much will match whatever you create in the game engine anyway. But yeah, I mean, the costs are, are high for some development, but I think that uh, depending on who you work with and who you go to, um, and we tend to kind of prefer people who are kind of uh, experimenting and learning and collaborating with other people 
So rather than it being like, oh, you come to us for, oh, yeah, we're going to pay you this much to do this, is let's collaborate on this project. Similar to what we've done on the Anglo Sikh uh, Virtual Museum, because it was like me and Brenda talking. I'm from a 3D engineering background. He is from a historic background. We talked and we said, oh, what if this could be used and, you know, how could we do it? Can it be, you know, we started experimenting and working our way. And I think that sort of approach is the type of relationships that we need to build and uh, building information. So when I was working for the engineering company, we got one of the first Oculus headsets. And so we were developing right at the beginning. Uh, you know, I was tasked with working out. I was given the headset and said, can you work out how to use it? And uh, so at that time, it was kind of like, OK, you know, we don't know where to go, how to use this. And it was a lot of learning and experimenting and mistake making. But um, yeah, I would say um, the, the, the more your organization will learn about the technology and understand the technology, the better able you are to go out and kind of uh, uh, purchase, you know, purchase the technology or implement the technology in your organizations because you know exactly what the limitations are of it. You understand, you know, what the what kind of cost is and what can be done and what doesn't work. Because I've seen a lot of places that have used VR. They spent a lot of money, but the impact hasn't been hasn't been equal to the money spent. So I think, um, you know, a lot of care and thought needs to be put into it more, really, rather than just throwing money at it and saying, "Oh, this is the next new thing," and you know, um, it'll be a good gimmick for us, make us look very, oh look, look at us, we're very advanced. Uh, we've had a really positive comment from a Crispin Payne uh, saying that was brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, and a few more on our Facebook where people sort of give us positive comments. Um, a question from Paul Baker. Uh, Technology is obviously moving very fast. Uh, once the risk of COVID-19 is reduced, is this the time for a museum to invest in buying a number of headsets or is there a game changer coming? OK, yeah. So um, I would say the, the quest, yeah. Is, 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 was the big game changer last year. And I mean, I was skeptical, skeptical about it until I actually tried it. And the fact that it's so accessible, even though it's less powerful than the other headsets, I mean, the other headsets are amazing, the quality is amazing, but the accessibility isn't like you, you saw the cables and the setup and complication. Uh, um, but with, the, with this headset, it's a game changer. And now they are developing the second version to this. Um, um, and that is gonna be coming out, I would guess sometime next year. And I think that is going to be the one to look out for because uh, it's going to be just as good as this one. It's going to be more powerful and it's going to be mobile. It's, it's going to be really good. But um, I would say experiment before you buy. You know, there's loads of places that you can go and experiment, learn about these things and try them. There's a lot of organizations out there which allow you, you know, universities and museums, and uh, sorry, universities and libraries and places like that or uh, places that you can try it. And I think that's where the game, and just to give you an idea of uh, how the headsets are going, uh, the, 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 the highest selling headset is actually the PlayStation VR, which is the games one. So that's interesting. So the, 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 the one that sold the most is the PlayStation VR, but obviously we're not interested in that because it's just a games thing, but you can see that the consumer market is, is where it's been picked up. The second uh, most um, successful headset is actually the Quest. So it only came out last year, but because it's so accessible, uh, people have been able to jump on board because it's only 400. I mean, I had a, if I quickly just share my screen, um, if I share that. So this gives you an idea of the, the kind of costs here. Um, so you're looking at the, the Quest, which comes in two versions over here. Um, it's, it's, it's four to 500 pounds here. Whereas um, the HTC Vive is too old now and they've moved on to these two new versions over here. And the Oculus Rift is basically Oculus is a um, new version, which is again 400 pounds. But but I think the Oculus Quest yeah, is the most interesting one, because uh, so if you were to go out and get one, I would say you know um, um, you know think about um, the, the Quest. And the reason for that is because um, it, it's mobile, it's kind of easy to develop for, um, it's not as powerful as the other ones. But uh, one thing I would say is it's a slightly different uh, development method. So it, it's rather than developing for a computer, like when you're developing applications for the other VR headsets, you're actually you're actually making an application for a PC that will run on a headset. But when you're producing an application for the, the Oculus Quest, what you're actually doing is you're making an application for a mobile device because it runs off a mobile device in the headset. So I would say just, just be mindful of that. It's a slightly different process, but um, I would say uh, the future is, headsets like this, uh, non-tethered, they're called, so they're non-wired, 
And so, yeah, yeah. So that one, and when the new one comes out, I think that's going to be the one. I've got a question here that was sent to me privately, so I'm not sure if you got that. It was from Lucy uh, Astill. It's, yeah. Uh, do you think the technology will ever get to the point where visitors to museums can use these unsupervised? I think it will happen. The, the, there's a couple of issues with it being kind of left in a museum. Number one is that the cost of it and the fact that they're very kind of, um, they're quite, quite fragile, really, to be fair. They're not really like a, like a, you've seen the headsets that they have in museums, they're quite rugged and they can be replaced easily or the touch screens are quite solid. With this, it's something that can fall around and get knocked around very easily. So they're not built for public kind of use, they're built for personal use. So if we could make like, a, and we thought about this, if we could make like a, a case for these, which is a bit more kind of rugged, then that would help. The other problem that you have with it is the environment that it runs in. It doesn't actually run. So with a touch screen that you have in a museum, it runs within its own application. You can't exit it. You can't actually exit it and go into the computer. With these systems, because they're heavily controlled by the manufacturers that make them, they want you to use their environment. Facebook wants you to use theirs. Vive wants to use uh, the Steam system. Um, what happens is you're, you're kind of locked into their kind of um, uh, environment, not into your application. So there's a chance that people can kind of exit out of the application into the wider environment of that headset. There are ways to mitigate it, which is like you, you, you change the button. Uh, so you change the button instead of a click, you have to keep it pressed five seconds or something like that. So you can kind of uh, mitigate it. But I think it will get there once um, those type of uses, but once it starts to get those types of uses a bit more, then the manufacturers will start to say, actually, there is a use case for public kind of use. So we need to create something. The only time I've seen it actually work in a public place is where the VR headset was actually uh, put onto like a, um, a spinner. And you know, like at the piers, you get those little things where you can look in and you can look at the environment looking around. It was actually used in that situation. So people could easily come up, they wouldn't be able to pick it up, it was fixed in place, but they were able to come up and then have a look at what the environment would have looked like years ago or something like that. So that's the only time I've seen it being used in a public space. But I think up until then, currently it's gotta be supervised unless it's kind of stuck in one place so people can't pick it up and they can just come up and then put their eyes to it. So that's what I would say. Um, I'm mindful of the time. We have got a comment from Jagdev Singh Verdi saying, excellent, learned a lot about this technology. It's a shame about the restrictions on sanitizing during the COVID crisis. Maybe we need to explore new and different ways of sanitizing. Uh, and I think that is probably a really good reflection on where we are uh, as yeah. a world at the moment. Everything is adjusting to uh, the new normal as it's described um, uh, and the way of working, you know, schools, hospitals, you know, restaurants everything has been impacted by covid and actually maybe the use of this technology might be a useful way uh, to support you know the work of museums and people still engaging and interacting with history uh, taron thank you ever so much uh, for your presentation and asking uh, answering all of those questions in detail and thank you to the audience for uh, joining us this evening um, if you are interested in some of the work that we're doing, uh, please do check out our Facebook and Twitter pages uh, or visit our website on www.angloseekmuseum.com. I'd like to say thank you to the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, who have funded this project of the anglo Sikh Virtual Museum, um, without whom we may not have been able to uh, do all of the work that we are so passionate about uh, bringing to the wider world. Um, the work that we've done with schools uh, and you know, places like Falcons Primary School in Leicester, the Royal Armouries, New York Museum, um, it's been a real joy to see how much positive feedback and engagement we've had from uh, members of the public, but also picking up on the interactive experience and how much young people particularly uh, learn uh, by using technology in VR headsets. Um, if you're interested in some of our future events, keep an eye on our Facebook page and our website. Um, and if you have any uh, questions post event that you'd like to ask about the technology uh, or the VR headset, go onto our Facebook page, drop us a message or drop us an email at info at seekmuseum.com. Um, and we will be having probably some 
future webinar events. So do keep an eye out for those and look forward to having you all back there. I'm just going to tell you about an exciting panel discussion event that we've got going on uh, on Sunday, the 14th of June, regarding the film The Black Prince, um, which will be detailed on our website and our Facebook page. Um, and for those of you who don't haven't heard of Sutin Satinder Sotaj, uh, a world famous singer, he'll be joining us as part of the panel discussion alongside the Sikh Museum Initiative's Gurinder Singh Man, uh, where we'll be discussing some of the objects from the Anglo Sikh Museum. Uh, I hope this has been an informative and interesting webinar. Uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, thanks ever so much. Uh, stay safe uh, and hopefully uh, look forward to encountering you uh, at one of our future events. Have a lovely evening. Bye.